Hey everyone, Jay with 99 Cigars. And as part of our three-part feature on Kazdagli Cigars, uh, we're sitting down with Kazdagli founder and co-owner Jeremy Kazdagli, who's uh, joining us for a virtual interview. And he's uh, coming to us all the way from uh, Estonia. I think it's Tallinn, is that es Estonia, Tallinn, Estonia. Uh, hello, virtual hello to all of you. We're <laughs> yourself here. That's it. We're used to this now. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's great to have you, and thank you for taking the time. I know it's late there. I think it's um, after 8 o'clock where you guys are, but it looks like you're having a good time sitting in that beautiful Oh, family. God, yes. <laughs> it gives me a great excuse not to be involved with chaos, the family dinner <laughs> chaos. So, so thanks for that. <laughs> so, you know, tell me, um, you know, how are you guys weathering this, this COVID-19 storm? I'm sure it's probably a little bit different than what were, we're experiencing here in North America in general. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, retailers yeah. are suffering badly, but as a cigar manufacturer and as an ambassador of the cigar world, how is this, uh, how, how, what are your thoughts on what's going on? Well, here? my thoughts on it, I mean, I suppose let's just talk about the tobacco side rather than the personal stuff. We could all chat about that with cigars, but um, as far as tobacco, um, demand has gone up because um, you find a lot of tobacco smokers or premium cigar smokers, it's their hobby. They've got a hell of a lot more time to enjoy their hobby. And interestingly enough, a lot of time reading reviews, you know, sitting down and watching, you know, such good fellows as yourself, which, uh, right. you know, we're all ambassadors for this, for this wonderful thing. So demand has gone up. I mean, during, as personally as a company, um, we have probably opened up, opening up four to five new markets whilst all this thing went on because people were seeing Zoom meetings, reviews, what have you. And so that's helped us. But where the absolute nightmare is for us, um, of course, tragic, personal tragedies aside, but as a business, is cargo. We can't, there's a lack of civil aviation, so supply is the difficulty. Right. Especially me sitting this side, like you guys in America, brands that they can, can get stuff into Miami. But in Europe, uh, we've just had, and uh, Martin, true, are you, are you gonna be still around, right? Sorry. Well, save that cigar, man. Don't let it, smoke it at home. Sorry, that you can edit that bit out, but you know, sorry, it's just one of our very loyal guests. Yeah. Okay, Martin. Don't, don't ever okay. get rid of a cigar, man. Nope. Nagamist. <laughs> Headed. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, basically, we just had our first cargo since December arrived wow. um, uh, this last week because, of course, we had a big December cargo and then we had two to three months to make the next one coming in and that's when it hit. So we've had stuff sitting around since March and we've just got it in and I can tell you one, it was a relief. Um, but uh, secondly is that cargo prices have gone up 300%. I mean, it's, it's gonna get a knock on event eventually to um, pricing in the shops, I'm sure it's part of it because it's nuts, nuts. So it, that's the problem, logistics. Demand has generally gone up in all markets. If I speak to <clears> Germany, <throat> Norway, um, uh, in fact, even Emirates, everyone's saying we're out of cigars, but demand has never been as good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. 20% increase in the market uh, uh, va value um, trading in Poland, for instance. So, you know, and I'm sure in America, it's always the biggest market, dwarfs us all. But, yep. you know, I get that from Vladar, our, our great guy there. So, you know. That's it. That's what is going on. You know, right. it's, it's supply. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, you, you, you guys have a great story. You have a great story. You kind of uh, walked me through a little bit. You have some of it online on your website. Yeah. But, you know, take a few minutes and give us the highlight reel on how you got started in the cigar business and sure. how you ended up where you are today. Sure. Um, and all started... Um, well, for me, we obviously had a family history involved with it, but to be totally honest, I was too a bit unaware of the Castagli side and premium cigars uh, because I kind of the family is actually quite uh, famous for huge family divorces as well. So <laughs> I grew up my mother's side of the family. I mean, even since you know, I kind of divert a few things because they're kind of interesting. But when Google first came along and people started uh, finding out online, what do you put your family name in? Our first thing comes up as Castagli versus Castagli, and that was going back to the uh, early 1900s, and then subsequently, in every bloody generation, a nightmare. <laughs> so um, I grew up with my Australian mum, uh, and uh, I was just uh, became a bit of a scuba diving bum after all the best schools, 
Um, and uh, you'd have thought I would have known better, been a merchant banker or something like that. But no, I chucked all that away. Um, had been airline business, did some work in Africa, um, what have you. And eventually I was just scooting around to uh, Jamaica and thought I'd dip into Cuba. Um, that was in the mid-1990s. Right. And uh, long <laughs> story short, I started just picking up Cuban cigars and going back to Jamaica and uh, giving them to this wonderful place called Morgan Harbor Hotel in Port Royal um, in Kingston. So um, that's how it started me. I got back to England and uh, after six months of an extended scuba trip <laughs> and uh, he said, where have you been? Cigars. And at that stage and still like today, Cuban cigars are hard to come by. So I started treating with Havanos goods. Sorry to say that, you know, no longer, not doing it any longer. Anybody <laughs> looking at me out there in America. Um, but what I was allowed to do and built slowly was to uh, deliver my own blend, which was created by a chap called Carlos Valdez Mosquera um, in Havana in 1997. And I was bringing out small amounts, like it started off about a thousand cigars a month, going to the clubs and hotels in London. And from there, the big game changer was meeting some of the Saudi royal family who would then come to Cuba with me and they would be getting my cigars. And because they were made specially for people and certain celebrities, it was called Bespoke Cigar. It was a name that adopted me. Um, so we were known as Bespoke Cigars, plus I was dealing with Havanos. So that was how it all started. Uh, we had that business going to about 2010, dealing, I was dealing with some Havanos stuff, but also, um, uh, dealing with my own sort of blend, which was fantastic, by the way. It was like um, <clears throat> this chap, uh, Carlos Valdez, I mean, he was one of the, one of his social club of cigar rollers. He was very, very famous. Mm -hmm. He would often go around the, the world of Habanos, to Hong Kong, doing, you know, presentations, working for his $14 a month, you know, but we would supplement that, of course. We did cigars with him. Um, and he used to work in Oida Monterey back in uh, the 1950s. So as a young kid, so um, a teenager, I suppose. And so his blends were Oida de Monterey. Um, so what is that? That is mild, sweet, uh, with a lovely, lovely body on it. So yeah. do with the terroir, the earth, iron rich area, San Juan y Martinez. Right. So um, I moved to Estonia actually in 2004 because Estonia was about to join the EU um, and uh, the zero corporation tax here. And uh, it's a nice. beautiful place. So I yeah. checked it out and I fell in love with it. And eventually I kind of a couple of years after that met my, was to be my wife and now I've got standing kids. So that's what I came. I came for business first, guys, not the girls. By the way, the girls are sussing <laughs> right now. You have to move for, if you want to, you want to get- Come on, tell the truth. You've got to go to Minsk. You've got to go to move Minsk. I mean, it, it, I mean, it was a smorgasbord. I mean, a beautiful here, obviously. Yeah. Um, so that was that bit. Now, where we, where, what got us here today was that uh, Carlos retired. Um, uh, it was about 2010. I had two big markets then. We had um, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia as the main one, a lot of private clients. And we were just about to emerge into Belarusian market, 2012. We were mm -hmm. um, uh, pretty much a monopoly going in there around 2012. And um, uh, so what am I going to do for my cigar supply? Uh, but then I'd quit Habanos Goods and I was just working my brand. So Cuba just closed down for me. I mean, they have a lot of their own problems. I won't dwell on them. But uh, I went to Nicaragua. I did go to see some Cuban guys, ex Habanos guys in yeah. Costa Rica. Um, and we started to put some stuff together there just to keep things going. Uh, we had done some trading to America um, through uh, what we did there was we had my good friend, Man Friday in Cuba, Pepe, Pepe uh, Jose Suarez. Or Jose Suarez Castro was his full name. Castro is like Smith in bloody Cuba, I think. <laughs> um, so uh, he'd gone to Dominican Republic looking after Habanos in Santo Domingo, one of their shops. And he started creating also some Dominican cigars to ship to America with our cottontails and other sort of weird ones, which we're doing from Cuban, he was just supplementing some Dominican tobacco. So we had some presence in America. Mm -hmm. um, sure. But anyway, yeah. So, so, so there, was, there, was some, there was a lot of people wanting our stuff and especially my Irish guy that took a lot of my Cuban stuff. And he liked some of Dominican. He was helping getting clients into America as well. So there this market. So what I was going to do, um, I found that the Costa Rican stuff wasn't, we always try 
factories on lanceros because I love lanceros, one of my favorite things. And if a factory can't construct a great lancero and do it consistently, then I'll... I'll Hard to do, yeah, not many can do it. Not many can do it, but that was kind of, it's my personal favorite, my father's personal favorite. And anyway, we can talk about lanceros all day. So um, it was 2012 and there's a friend of mine called Mike Murphy, uh, who we used to have a huge debates about Dominican versus Cuban stuff. And he'd started his little brand, Bella Terra from Nicaragua and Dominican Republic. And he said, Jeremy, have you heard of the Kelmers? I said, well, I heard of Davidoff and Kelner Senior. He says, well, his, his uh, son, uh, who's been working with his dad for like 19 years at that time, yep. uh, he is um, setting up his boutique factory. You've got problems with your blending special in Lancero, so um, please, you know, give it a try. And that's where the whole adventure with uh, Dominican Republic and the Kellner Boutique Factory started and is now the core of our brand. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it happened over a morning, a eureka moment. So a few eureka moments you have in this business. Um, one, the first was meeting Carlos Valdez in Cuba. And the second was when I handed some of my original grand, you know, Lanceros, which we were calling the Grand Cafe after the launch in Minsk, at the Grand Cafe in Minsk, Belarusia. Nice. And uh, I gave him some Cuban stuff. And uh, he said, Jeremy, he had a few smokes and I told him a bit of a story I told you. And he says, uh, come tomorrow and we'll do a blind tasting. And uh, sure enough, I came the next day and I remember I had five uh, Lanceros staring at me with A to, a to D on it. And Mike sitting there and there's Hendrik. And he says, start smoking these. I says, well, what's in them? Right, Jeremy, let's start your cigar education. I don't care if you've been in this business for like, you know, 17 years at that time. He says, but we won't tell you what's in them because then it wouldn't be a blind tasting, would it? And you get subjectivity getting involved and placebo and what have you. And right. you're going to want to want one more than another. But two things we can say, no Cuban tobacco. And two, Jeremy, don't talk about Cuba and Dominican Republic. It's a sensitive topic in the tobacco <laughs> business. Um, uh, yeah, welcome to the world, right? So, yeah, so there was it. I was then trying, going, smoking these Lanceros, making like an inch of one and then another. And I got to number three, let's call it Lancero number C. Uh, and I gave me the aromas. It gave me, not the dry aromas of the Cuban, but it gave me everything I was looking at for my original Cuban stuff. Uh, I won't say it's a Cuban cigar, it's very Cuban-esque and people accuse me. Why are you trying to make Cuban-esque cigars? I said, guys, because that's what my market demanded. The Saudis wanted Cuban from me. Well, obviously I stuck with this third one and I said, Hendrik, don't confuse me with the other two. I'm going for it. He writes a number down. That's like a formula number for this blend. He signed it and he says, that's yours now. Now do you want to know what's in it? And then he broke down the whole tobacco for me. I can tell you that if you wish, but it basically, um, from that point onwards, everything changed. I could know for sure I got great quality control. Anyone can make a Lancero can make anything, you know, and yep. then a provenance of a tobacco with Kellner Jr. So I called it a partnership we started off with from that point onwards. And um, uh, thus, thus we, were, we could get into America decently as well. Um, I guess it was 2015 we started going in in volume, any kind of volume. If you right. can call our small production a volume at right. all. Um, right. But there you go. That's that's a kind of potted history. That's awesome. So you know, just just as a follow up question, do you do you? I'm, I'm guessing it's somewhere in the world. Uh, somebody has laid down some boxes of your original Cubans. Uh, is that is that accurate, or do you have some? Did you lay some down? And, there's didn't the didn't lay anything the down, smoked them all. Um, I think some people in Saudi Arabia still have some. Um, that would make sense. I'm, I'm horrible to, yeah. I mean, actually now I just had a call this evening from the Saudis because, you know, we had to drop out of that market when Mohammed bin Salman came along. It was a big game changer for us and moved yeah. us big to more into America, really, because we didn't have yeah. the production to help America. But without Saudi, we were the biggest brand there, I think, uh, two and a half years ago. Wow. So, um, you know, we, I'm sure some Saudis have some stuff, but tonight I was called and says, there's no cigars left in Saudi Arabia. Send anything you can. The, the royal guy will get it through, you know, whether it's MBS or one of his mates, I don't know, but we're going to yeah. send something over. Right. But um, uh, so I honestly think if they've smoked for a less stock, there's probably nothing left there either. So I'm sorry. 
<laughs> Surely they got plenty of KSAs, right? I mean, that's one of the unicorns we're trying well to get Well done. KSA, yeah, uh, from, from Prince Khaled. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Prince Khaled, uh, he was that guy I met who was the kind of game, you know, who was the one to put bespoke on the map, certainly in that area. Yeah. Um, and uh, we also used to introduce him to not just Carlos, uh, but Tabuada, Gormito, Cuerto, and all these guys used to just make his cigars for him. And his KSA um, ring was put on in the Pardigas factory. Abel Esposito was doing this. It's like, what the fuck? You know, <laughs> I, I bet, you know what he wanted. He, so he's a gentleman. I, I, I know that um, La Matilda Cigar in France wanted some information on, on KSA cigars. And I did have three or four of those. And I, I sent some over for them to have. And I said, could you tell us about him? I said, well, Prince Carla would be honored, but he's very shy. He won't give him, he's a private man, I should say. And he doesn't want to give too much information, but uh, right. that's what uh, I've heard. There's something there. Yeah. Right. He's, a, he's a total gent. I mean, he would come to Cuba at least one week each year or sometimes two. And we'd be sitting together and he said, Jeremy, this is like the best weeks of my life. And he would have his, he would stay always at the Melia Cahiba. Uh, he would eat at, um, uh, oh gosh, I mean, what's the El Alhibe restaurant? Different easy chicken, beautiful chicken place. It's been going for fucking years. The only decent state restaurant. <laughs> and, um, and he would do this up at eight. We go around picking up his pre orders, and there'd be like, you know, his luggage trolleys full of, you know, luggage. We had full of cigars going up to his suite for seven days. And then he'd go to sleep, never drink, uh, he wouldn't drink alcohol, he just didn't like it. And then he would like it uh, after a dinner at nine o'clock, go, go to bed. He says, I'm so excited about tomorrow, which is going to be the same damn thing. That he's going to do it each day. <laughs> he's so excited. He used to leave. And, and uh, yeah, he has a huge passion for them. And there's many of them like that in Saudi. Yeah. You know, really good for guys. Sure. Yeah. Mm. You know, if I, if I could go back to uh, Heinrich Kellner and your work with him now, correct me if I'm wrong, but he's currently producing four of your lines, correct? Yes. And yes, and go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we, we have the traditional line, which was the based upon that original blend uh, that we had with him, based on that Cuban esque style. And by the way, just Delicious. to give the ultimate test, when I left those, uh, then I left him the first time with some bundles of Lanceros and uh, what we then call the flying pig. Of course, that had to change, as we know. Uh, I now call it the cottontail. I sent a <laughs> bunch to uh, the Saudis, I sent a bunch to Cigar Time in Russia. And without telling them anything, and they said, man, who's your, your, your Cuban roller? Because Carlos retired. I said, mate, no Cuban tobacco here. So it fooled a lot of people. Um, and it's, it's not to thing. say that, yeah, I mean, it is a good thing because it achieved what we wanted to. So that's why we called it a traditional line because it was my tradition. That's where it came from. Right. And when my family got involved in the 50s, we always had Cuban cigars around, you know. So yeah. there's that. Uh, there's the Basilica range, which was created originally for the Saudi palate. And uh, that's the one with my great great grandfather's face on it. And uh, obviously, you know, they're available freely. Um, but uh, so we had the Basilica line. They did all the blend uh, testing in Beirut with the uh, Saudi distributors and Saudis who were sitting around. Uh, then we have the cabinet selection, which of course is um, uh, originally done for the Swedes. We're into their uh, coffees. So, you know, you can read about those. And interestingly enough, we have a great relationship with the. Uh, Club Mareva in Split, the home mm -hmm. of the Cigar Smoking World Championship. Marco Bilic, Rocky Patel is now making his championship cigar. But we make the house cigar there. And we, right. it's the Club, Club Mareva line. So those are the four lines. Right. Uh, and then the Daughters of the Wind, of course, uh, is coming from somewhere else. It's from Costa Rica? Correct. Costa Rica, by those uh, factory that very few people have heard of, uh, run by Cubans. Right. And uh, so we always had a relationship going with these guys when I, when I left Havana behind me on all that production, they <coughs> were making special cigars for Saudi for me. Weren't part of my actual general line. They didn't have many bands on it. They right. still were purists there. They just wanted something that looked like a Cuban as in no bands and like one of my originals. And, uh, 2018, we uh, launched the daughters of the wind, um, into America first. Uh, no Cuban stuff in there, obviously, but created by these uh, Cuban guys. Um, and what's interesting about that factory is that Jose, uh, who runs it, he doesn't smoke cigars, nor does his family. None of them smoke. So what? we uh, no, no, they just love the idea. They like that they, they, they're making money out of it. 
So, um, and he's got his own plantation yeah, up right. in Puriscal. And he knows about the growing thing. He, he, he was never an agricultural engineer before, but you can call him one now. Um, he's very heavily involved now with getting a plantation set up in Ecuador for our own wrapper leaves. Mm -hmm. um, he's only uh, creating for really our brand and there's another brand called El Septimo you might have come across. Yep. Um, but uh, we uh, are like probably his biggest one now, client. And um, a lot of Peruvian tobacco he gets access to. And what's the wonderful thing is like, I get to blend that myself. Nice. So what I mean is because he doesn't smoke tobacco. So I'm sitting there with one of my ex one of the Cubans that, you know, got away from that damn country. He was a guy called George, who used to be very heavily involved with Habanos and they dumped that. And so he manages our stuff in Costa Rica. Um, and uh, so I'd sit with him and I'd say, right, what new tobaccos you got? So especially for the daughters of the wind line is that we got this Peruvian pinar. Never heard of it. Okay, let's put that. We were rolling, you know, do a little fuma taste, yep. like Panatella of that. Yep. I had something called Dominican, something from Dominican Republic. I said, it smells like caramel and sea salt. What's the name of this leaf? No say, no idea. We don't know. It's something as a project we're doing. So I said, okay, let's call it the caramello then. So hence the caramello leaf. And uh, then we, uh, he had his own Costa Rican stuff. Um, and so we use that as a binder from Puerto Scal. All these tobaccos are quite exotic. I mean, you don't, Capura Scal, his plantation is only eight hectares, of which only four, he does a, a crop rotation, so four right. hectares in any one year. <clears throat> so these are the tobaccos I fell in love with there. We put them together, then different combinations and primings to mm -hmm. get to the eventual end result. Right. Uh, a terrible four days of sitting around smoking. The same tobaccos, but in different percentages and primings. So I can honestly say, they said, oh, you must be the blender then. I said, well, let's be honest about this. I said, I'm like an amateur chef beginning some of the best ingredients. So, you know. <laughs> it's kind of hard to screw that up, right? <laughs> no. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm sure it's possible. No, no, but you're right. You're right. I mean, I know, you know, I was asked this by Smoke Blossom girls. You know, are you a blender? Who's the master blender? I said, oh, we're on a real bullshit in the business. <laughs> you know, Hendrik is the blender for my four lines. Mm -hmm. He's the guy that, you know, but I'm the one that tells them what characteristics I want. And then I do the um, blind tasting, um, always a blind tasting. I learned my first lesson that first time. Um, and from there, I select what I want and also the formats I'm looking for. So, you know, I'm kind of like the producer of the film, right? Uh, he's the guy that's the cameraman and, uh, and the editor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we can fine tune it. I can suggest some tobaccos and he will try some of those and they might work or not. So that's the master blending sort of like story that I think a lot of us go through. Right. A lot of people say I blended this cigar, but. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, coming, from, from, coming from our perspective, when you look at all these different regions yeah. where uh, cigars are popular, and what I mean popular, um, where they're made. So Nicaragua is becoming, you know, this, I don't want to call it the second Cuba because yeah. it deserves more mention than that. Um, the same yes. Dominican Republic and even Honduras, but people forget about places like Peru, Peruvian tobacco. People forget about Costa Rica. And when I, you know, when I first, in fact, I, I have to say, Daughters of the Wind, the dolmen that we reviewed, I think it was oh. back in 2018 or 20, early 2019, uh, was really the first Costa Rican cigar I had smoked at that time. And of course, it was well, created in Costa Rica, but one was, Costa Rican leaf. Yeah, one Costa Rican leaf. It's oh, it was? coming from. Yeah, it's got one Costa Rican leaf in it. It's not Costa Rican. It's Costa oh, Rican Oh, it's not made. a puro. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's not a puro. No, God. Oh, okay. I, if it I was, it, you, if you wanted one of those, you can buy one at the San Jose airport. I, I, I give you my commiserations. No, they're not that bad. No, but no, created in Costa Rica. It's important to know that like, you know, Costa Rica, like Vegas Santiago or Tobacos de Costa Rica, who mm -hmm. make for Atabay and Byron, and they do some stuff yep. for us as well. Right. Um, fabulous stuff. But most of their tobacco is coming from you know, Nicaragua, Peru. I'm pleased you mentioned Peru again, because, you know, Peru is where tobacco all started from, right? Kangaroos from Australia, horses from America. Uh, I was reading the Gutenberg Press uh, many years ago to understand the history of tobacco. And this is where tobacco originally grew wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, the only reason there's not more of it around is that they also grow stuff that goes up your nose. <laughs> and not out of your nose. So, um, uh, you know, and, and that's the case. There's a guy called Granado who's Italian, and he's got the big plantation there in the Peruvian Perodoro, 
Um, now we're doing the Proving Pinar. I think the Better Door has got the same problems. I think that might be crashing to an end. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, Peru, but it's expensive and it's the home. And what does Peruvian tobacco give you? Um, I was trying to, it's very sweet. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and it's very sweet. And I asked Hendrik this because we use a lot of Peruvian tobacco in our blends, even with him. And I said, is it rather like, you know, you're making, you know, uh, if you're making a tomato sauce, okay? It, to make it really meaty, you add anchovies, you add anchovies, right? Some people don't like anchovies. They wouldn't even taste them because they completely disappear in that sauce and they beef up everything around it. Yep. Is that what Peruvian tobacco is doing, Hendrik? Kinda. He says, well done, Jeremy. <laughs> because basically what it's doing is it's taking some of that harshness. I mean, obviously the oils are mingling with the thing. We know how it works. So, I mean, I'm so look, you know, I'm, I'm a novice when it comes to the blending or, you know, understanding that side of it. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously you learn over 20, I was at 23 years in the business now, mm -hmm. but on that case, he said, yeah, absolutely. Because it's a sweetener. So Peruvian puro, would you try it? He says, well, you like sweetness, Jeremy. Do you like candy floss? But you know, there are some nice ones out there. I know that uh, Mitchell Orchard has the Inca cigar or whatever, and he's, he's, you know, he's had some hit and misses with that, but I think it's a, a really great thing. He's got a hundred percent Peruvian, uh, Puro out there, so if you can find one of those, try it. Yeah, nice. So, um, take a step back. So, at one point, uh, the company was bespoke, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, yes. I, I know probably most people understand that there was a change, but I don't think they understood why. And I know you kind of touch on this on your website, but walk us through how you, you went from bespoke to Castagli's. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when the Smoke Blossom girls asked me, they said, Jeremy, a lot of our um, uh, followers think that you did it for publicity, like Coke and New Coke. I said, oh, if only. No, basically, it was, the um, uh, thing is that, as I told you, that, um, you know, we had been doing some bespoke cigars going into the States in small amounts. And in 2015, um, we, were, we did open into um, uh, Biggs Mansion, Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a great guy who was one of the members who was living here in Estonia, so he introduced us. So we started opening properly, not big, big, but just through bigs, so to speak. And Cigar Journal did an article on it. And so we thought, well, we better sort of uh, trademark our name in America because we were trademarked around the world as bespoke right. through Madrid, you know, which is that covers Europe and other places, you know. So right. um, we went to the, uh, we did the applications and we were eventually denied bespoke because as a U.S. patent often said, it's a generic name. It's kind of like a gray or hand rolled. It bespoke means made to the order of. It's in our vocabulary. So you can use bespoke as a part of your symbol. So uh, that's what we thought was the end of it. And so when we started opening properly and raising people's, you know, because we got a lot of publicity, especially through um, uh, Charlie in Half Wheel, uh, prior to IPCPR in 2018, when I think he said this is one of the brands to look out for, you know. Um, and we were starting to fly high. We had Vlada donated to it. The Clayton um, in Chicago had helped launch us, relaunch us in. His Biggs Mansion changed ownership or changed management, and we, we, we stopped with them. And uh, just prior to IPCPR, we, got a, we had a big booth. I mean, I was like, hey, man, America, America market's great. You know, it's like uh, doing more in one lounge than some of our countries. You know? <laughs> and um, uh, we had a cease and desist from Alec Bradley, or Alan Rubin's lawyer. Right. And so that was a bit of a, a nasty wake-up call. And uh, in that email was his certificate that he had the trademark uh, granted to him by the U.S. Patent Office in... Uh, I think it was September or October 2017. Well, I was going saying, what do you say? What WTF? <laughs> right? What the yeah. fuck? So we got hold of the patent office. I mean, it's no, no, no harm on Alan Rubin. I mean, they got the trademark. And the US patent office says, well, uh, he applied for it so many times. And I said, yeah, but how could he be granted it? And we were denied. And anyway, they said, well, he got granted it in a court of law, Jeremy. You know, you know we, we could be answerable for that one um and plus we had all these invoices of our cigars going in so we thought it was going to be okay and in fact alan uh, said look let's sit down i, mean, I asked his lawyer let's let's sit down in vegas and be adults about it and discuss it right and 
we did have a few sort of like invoices we sent to them prior to 2000 and uh you know, back to 2007 and stuff. <laughs> saying I, we were in the market ahead of you anyway, right? So, right. Mm, so I remember we had our booth, and then you go to his booth, and it's a fucking massive thing. It's like David walking into Goliath's uh, chamber, right? So uh, <laughs> he basically said, you know, Jeremy. Uh, again, a long story short, there's going to be confusion in the marketplace. I want this for my sons for um, uh, black market cigars. And um, I'm afraid, you know, I'll fight on this one. Personally, I don't have half a million dollars in the bank to fight it, you know. And so I was speaking over that. And by the way, Alan was a total gent. He said, Jeremy, if you take the decision to change the name. And I said, I said yeah, I mean, can I keep the cigars on the shelves until they're sold here if I do change it? He said, absolutely. You know, there's no way I would want this to happen to me to be facing these decisions. Good. And by the way, Jeremy, it'd be only in America that I would do this, nowhere else, you know? Yeah. Um, and so he was very fair and he's got his company to protect as well. So sure. um, uh, I remember chatting to Robert Caldwell, Riste from Yassam Kral. And these are friends of mine. And they all said, Jeremy, why didn't you have a Castagli? This is your family name. And this is what your history is. And, you know, bespoke is kind of everywhere now. And I said, yeah, it was a name that adopted me. So I decided to make the decision to do this yeah. and do it worldwide. Because in social media, you can't have it today. You can't have one, you know, Paradiso and the San Cristobal is having all sorts of issues. They have to always say formerly known as or known there as, you know. So uh, we did it worldwide. And uh, I have been so happy about it because, you know, thanks, Alan. You know, and I hope you good luck with what you're doing because... You know, my father kind of teared up when I told him. We got the Colossus married to the Castagli name. Uh, first time since 1959. So, you know, that was the original name. It was trademarked under in 1885. So there you go. Kind of a blessing in disguise, yes? Oh, absolutely. Right? right? It cost me quite a bit just to change the marketing, whatever. Alan never put any pressure on the things. He was, he was asking how it was going, you know, six months later. We still got a few stuff in some of the, the lounges. I wouldn't want him to remove it. He said, no, you're right. You know, so he's, you know, everybody saved themselves legal fees and I'm happy, you know, and there you go. That's why it happened. Okay. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> Cool story. Hey, um, switch gears a little bit more. So um, I know you guys don't um, have a lot of this in, in Europe, um, but you know uh, the cigar community here in North America, or specifically the U.S., got kind of a win, another win, when a um, D.C. Circuit Court tossed out uh, warning labels for cigars. Yes, I heard that. Wow, unbelievable. You yeah. got all this other problem, but you got these beautiful boxes still on display. That's yeah, great. yeah, exactly. I mean, here you've got this great art, art artisanal culture, yeah, yeah. Um, and and legacy, and we're just going to smother in these these hideous things. But yeah. you know the the you know that might be a battle that was won, but I think the war is still going on. From your perspective as a manufacturer, how are you guys dealing with potential? these deeming rules, these very, very tight mm. deeming rules, which we all hope that they're going to go away at some point. But um, I'd like to get your thoughts on that as well. Well, in America, um, what we do have is I was telling you about some old invoicing, right? And uh, there was a guy called Tony Serino, who's our facilitator. And he had imported some of our stuff mm -hmm. way back then. So we got a chance of uh, grandfathering. Um, some, some, some of our stuff, you know, right. so, right. Um, which is so good. That's that one good. thing we, we yep. have that. So, you know, but obviously with all these new things, like we have the lovely pony express we did with a uh, small batch and they wanted to do another load, but like, you know, is there a future for it? We just don't know. Um, I hope you're getting, we've got some clients in here. So there's a bit of background. So I hope you can oh, hear no, me. That's okay. You're fine. Okay, good. So, um, uh, there, there, there's that. So, so we got a chance, but you know, the, I mean, in Europe, um, you know, we have different countries within the EU having different rules. Now, yeah. one thing I will say, and, uh, you know, because some people, when they look at, let's just talk about a box issue. Um, you know, the, these beautiful boxes came about in the 1920s, right? Yeah. Prior to that, um, you know, a lot of these dull wooden boxes, yeah? yeah. Many cigars didn't have bands. I, I, I even, you know, in today's, the Saudis, they want unbanded cigars. So, um, I always tell people not to be too worried because then you're going to live or die on the quality of your cigars. So in Ireland, 
uh, which we'd had been in the market there since uh, the late 1990s, and with my non-Cuban stuff since uh, 2010, 2000, with some of our Costa Rican stuff there, original, any whatever, all going there. And suddenly they've got zero packaging. That was about uh, two and a half years ago. We used to do 1,000 cigars a month there. Not big, but that's just for the Dublin market. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Guy Hancock says, now's your time, Jeremy. Now it's the equalizer. It doesn't matter if you're Artillo Fuente, Cuban, whatever, they're all gonna be sitting as brown sticks. Okay, with like little basic labels on them, all in the same dreadful, you know, like either white fax paper or whatever, with a simple print or some with nothing. Now it's just down to quality. Yeah. Now our, our markets went from 1,000 to 3,000 cigars a month. So only be aware if you think you've got an average brand, you know, blend. But, you know, customers will always buy cigars. The pretty box, boxes, I'm mostly worried for the box companies. I mean, yes, I love all these beautiful boxes, and it is history. But, um, you know, zero packaging in the market for our company has so far proved well. In Singapore, uh, same thing. In fact, uh, we're about to launch there, and it's when zero packaging's just come in. Yeah. And the same guy, um, uh, Kay, Kay Tech Hall, his name is, he said, Jeremy, now's the time to launch your brand. Because a lot of the amazing boxes out there, which sometimes the marketing is more than what's in them. You know, now it's a level playing field. <laughs> yeah, right. People are gonna taste what's good and what's bad. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, and, and, and it's traditional. In fact, when we did the cabinet selection, I wanted zero bands on those cigars. And I wanted, mm. I put them in those plain wooden boxes because traditionally that's what cigars were sold in. Yeah. And it was funny enough that, um, and here's a bit of tobacco history for all of you there. So not just talking about my brand here, is that when I was in Cuba in the early, in the mid nineties, sorry. And I was picking up, I was mostly working on a domestic market, what was available on the president of Habanos, Oscar Basulto, um, uh, would uh, sign everything off, right? And people were ordering, saying to me, Jeremy, Romy Julieta's boxes are 25, really beautiful, but can you get the cabinet selections? The boxes are 50. There are wheels of 50, no bands, and that very plain wooden box. That's what we want. Same for the punches in this thing. And, all, and most of the Oida Montres were in this format. And I remember asking, what, why? Why is this? And it's a traditional thing. One, of course, you'd think that maybe that the um, cigars together in a wheel actually age better. But also there was something interesting about it. And I spoke to... Um, the great Simon Chase about this, who's now gone, he was the expert in Cuban tobacco. And I says, Simon, I know we're enemies and competing against each other. But over a cigar, I said, why about this cabinet selection? It's like duller than this other one, but that's what people want. They want the dull stuff. So Jeremy, it goes back to the 1920s, actually. If you are the Duke of Somerset and you have your personal um, uh, cigars, bespoke cigars, if you wish, at the H. Upman factory, you would place your order Okay, these are not for the market. They weren't put in beautiful boxes. They were put in these plain wooden boxes, okay? And Duke of Somerset would maybe in his smoking room or his reception room have a beautiful French cabinet, mainly made in France, a beautiful cabinet, which uh, he would have made. They weren't hermetically sealed. You open the cabinet lid and there's slot holes for those boxes to slot in. That's the history of our cabinet selection and those dull boxes. That's where it all started. Okay, so hence cabinet selection, selected for a cabinet that was made in France. So when we did our uh, cabinet selection, they were all made with zero bands, zero packaging, zero beauty, but tradition, with a simple ribbon binding them together, yep. or with some, we did it with some grease paper going around. So there's the history of that. So don't be worried, we'll go back tradition and we'll still be smoking great cigars, <laughs> and you'll be only smoking the best ones. Oh, no, that's awesome. You know, you, you've, got, uh, you've got some pretty deep Cuban roots. And, you know, a, a lot of those in the market watched uh, the last few years when the quality of Cuban cigars really went down. I mean, it really went in the toilet there for a while. It, I think it's making a comeback. Um, mm. A couple of, couple of reports came out in late 2019 that, um, you know, sure, Cuba had some really bad luck. Um, they've had torrential weather, really bad weather. Um, and this, this whole rest to market kind of focus really. And couple of soil exhaustion. 
Yeah, yeah. So exactly. exhaustion. Exactly. So I think um, yeah. what this did is this allowed some of the Nicaraguan, some of the Dominican and others to kind of flourish. Now, as, as the, you know, the resurgence of, of the quality of Cuban tobacco and cigars um, is on the rise, uh, is, first of all, do you think that's going to hurt your business? And overall, uh, do you think it's going to hurt the business overall outside of Cuba? Mm, no, not at all, because they're never going to be that much of them. Um, you know, the target for in the late 90s, the Cuban production was something like 120 million premium cigars. And they used to get to about like 100 or maybe 90 million. And then what's it was last year or the previous year, about 70 million came out. And, you know, so they've got issues just in amounts of tobacco they can get. They've got, you know, um, a lot of problems, there, especially in wrapper leaf. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing that I love more than entering a Cuban rich environment because um, much as I love Cuban cigars, and someone's going to offer me a Cuban cigar now, I'll take a small format. I'll take like a Robusto or one of the Trinidad's or I, I won't go for their Lancero as much. I mean, if you can get a really good one, it's lovely, but it's rare. Because you see, what I came, what my, my learning point was when I'm smoking the New World cigars, as we, they call, I don't know why they call them New World cigars, the New World cigars, they're more complex than the Cubans. If somebody, you know, gives me a double Corona, I'll enjoy it, but I'll get bored. I mean, in, in essence, Cuba has the, the Vuelta Abajo region. It's about 30 square kilometers of really good tobacco rich areas, maybe a bit more than that. I don't, need to mm -hmm. me, don't quote me exactly the size, but it's tiny, right? And they have the Crow leaf, okay? And they have, if you ask the blend from a Cuban on his cigar, they'll talk about the Seco, the Lejero, and the Velado. Yeah, and it's very, they've got very little choice. Yes, it's good. Of course, it's good. But you, there's only so much you can do with it. Yes, you can fool around with the fermentations like the Cohibas. They give an extra fermentation, blah, blah, blah. Right. But for an American palate, I believe that if everything was really opened up to America and you could get some Habanos goods there, I think they're, they're interesting. I think every humidor should have some Cubans. But I think, generally speaking, you're going to say, well, the emperor has no clothes. Because <laughs> the... The, the amount of marketplace America has, I mean, it's huge. It is the market of the world, right? Um, for, for, for cigars, premium cigars. More's, more's, more's imported there than pretty much the rest of the world combined, easy. Really? But, and, and you have all these competing, especially about the tobacco boom, all these cigars competing against each other. You had Nicaragua raising its game. You know, and with these fabulous blends coming from there. And then Dominican Republic had to raise its game. And they're raising each other. It's called comp competition, okay, where Cuba never felt that. So that's why you got so many. You, you, you go to an a, a American uh, uh, lounge, you have so much choice that even now in Europe, where we have much more choice than we had, still people going to America, it's like, blimey, where do I start? You know, <laughs> and you've got the strong ones, you've got some of the F1's palette. And, and there's some great, great producers out there and, and brand owners, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm a brand owner more than a manufacturer. I mean, I, I've got a partnership with a fa two factories and I'm lucky enough to say we're probably the, two of the, the most important, one of the most important partners there of, of Hendrick Jr. And, and certainly the biggest one in, in, in the uh, IGM factory in Costa Rica. So I like to think we've got a really firm partner to depend upon each other. But, yeah. it is, you know, but the amount of brands you have is fabulous. Oh, and so uh, the Cubans can there. snuggle in there, but the, the American palate is, is, is very demanding because of this. Yeah. Hey, um, it looks like we're coming up at about 10 minutes, and I wanted to, to focus on a couple of your, your upcoming uh, cigars. And, you know, I was on your site the other day, and I caught wind yeah. of the cipher. Um, yes. So I think that's a fabulous story, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm a yeah. good buff, particularly with World War II. And when I saw that, I just, I just, I can't wait for this thing to come out. Can you tell us about Cypher or as much as you can? Yeah, I mean, basically it's going to come out next year now because of COVID. It's not the right time to launch this fabulous thing. Um, well, let's just say uh, we have access to all tobacco in, in Costa Rica. And so you might have something from Jeremy's past. It'll be secret. And it's secret, depending if it came from Dominican Republic or it comes from Peru or it comes from Kathmandu. Yeah. Um, because that's the cipher, right? That's the riddle, okay? <laughs> and uh, so 
So you're um, not going to release the blend details at all? No, 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 can't. Um, and oh, okay. the front of it. Um, okay. Well, you know, yeah, we can't. And it depends upon, you know, obviously what's happening with the FDA rules and whatever. We might yeah, not yeah. be able to have it in America. Yeah. I mean, that's the sad thing. I'm sure some would reach, reach over there and crawl there somehow. Um, but this has been something which I've been looking at doing for some time. And of course, uh, we were thinking of putting it in a box, which is like a Chinese puzzle box as well. Um, for those that want to read some of the story behind why I just did the Google Castagli fuck Hitler. And I'm sure you've done that. You see all the wonderful story behind it. So we have that. Um, other things which I'm looking at in the future and as a labor of love is the Napoleonic selection of cigars. Um, I'm a great fan of history as well, World War II and Napoleonic history. So I um, researched uh, certain French marshals, one uh, German, Fred Marshal von Blücher, for instance, Austrian, uh, Russian, and of course English, all coming into the colored boxes of the, that they had in those day, days, uh, and famous generals that were very famous about smoking cigars. So um, mostly Figurados they had. Um, I want to try to research the blends. It's very difficult to find what they had then. Um, but uh, this is something which I've been looking at for the last three or four years and putting it together in the research together. And we'll launch those in about two or three years. Uh, it takes a time to do these things. Sure. But um, it's, uh, you know, what I find about cigar smokers is they love talking about history. That uh, geopolitics comes into it as well. But oh, yeah. when you have old, old military guys and their stories about smoking and where I got the inspiration was again, looking for the Gutenberg press and some of the stories coming out in my desk in my office above my is a, we have general LaSalle going into battle with his tobacco, his pipe. He quoted, well, he started the uh, society of alcoholics in France in Paris in 1803. I think it was. And a lady said, uh, General, if you carry on like this, you're going to surely be dead. Because he was, many, he was a big duelist. I mean, he was sleeping with everybody's wives, right? And uh, he says, Madam, he says, you know, um, uh, if I don't have my tobacco, I'm not a man. And if I'm not dead by 30, I'm not a czar. I'm a coward. <laughs> so, so he went into the Battle of Wagram with his tobacco in his hand, right at the Austrians, <laughs> leading his men all the way, and he was slaughtered. And he was head of Napoleon's awesome. Light Cavalry. So you, you just look LaSalle, LaSalle, Wagram, Google it, and tobacco, and you see him uh, out with his tobacco. And you see the chaps behind him. When the picture was done, it was done by people that must have been there, because you can see the horror of the heavy cavalry behind him looking at it because he'd already wiped out his light cavalry. He, all his czars were wiped out in his battle. And then he took hold of the heavy cavalry, cavalry brigade and then he went in. And so you'll see the look on the face of all of them. Because generals used to fall back to the second line when it gets to the big charge in contact. No, not him. So an inspiration to us all, I think. <laughs> That's fantastic. Died with tobacco in there. And I think he was 31 or 32. So it was two years past the sell-by date. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, just awesome. one of many just love one it. of many stories love yeah. it so um you, you briefly mentioned earlier about your partnership with small batch and the pony express which yes is, unfortunately we we got there too late of course it's all been sold out i know uh, yeah. well we hope to do another lot this year great, great. we gotta see yeah all right all right, so are you still thinking about it, or is it a done deal? Well, it's, it's, well, it should be, well, it's down to what's going to happen in September, right? I mean, if you're yeah. going to suddenly produce these things and then you can't sell them, I think let's just go for it, because if not, we'll bring them over here. But we do have a small, I asked small batch, like, well, we've got 18 boxes here, just to write. So uh, they are, I would be smoking in front of you, one of those, but it's still in the bonded warehouse. Just to write. Okay. But that cigar um, was amazing, because... Not this is a blend interesting, based on the Daughters of the Wind blend, with a little bit of extra Lajero for the American palate. Uh, but we had it a box press. And these Cubans have never made a box press cigar. So they've done all this, what they call as a process, where you're waiting them down. And yeah, yeah. Jesus Christ, it was so sharp that we got a picture somewhere of uh, some of the guys in Small Batch. I think we got Andrew. And he's got the block of them, right? No cello, but just a block of cardboard. And he's pulling a few out. And they just don't drop down like Texas does. And, he's, he's saying, and he said, is this raffle leaf actually going to hold? Because it's so sharp. Um, but now uh, what they've done is they produced a, um, a proper cigar press for my, for my um, box press cigar. So we're going to have to do it. I'm, I'm going to 
vitamins of reduction. Uh, maybe you have to make, if, if small batch won't do it, to honor small batch, I would never make the same cigar if it wasn't going to be for them. So we'll, we'll alter part of a lane for whatever, because, and, you know, uh, they're great guys. They've been great support and uh, good people, you know. Um, any friends. chance you contract with somebody else? Sorry? You said any chance you would contract with somebody else if somebody came uh, to you and said, hey, Jeremy, we'd love to have something from you? Um, yes, depending on what it was. I mean, I think so. I mean, there's a few things that I was thinking of, um, but I can't talk about those now. Uh, there's a manufacturer out there. He's a great pal. He loves my grand cafes so because of this bloody thing going on. It's some conversation I have to have probably next year. Uh, yeah. But I, w I need to speak to him about it. But um, yeah, I mean, we have such a limited production that it's very hard. We did, we did of course, make a regional um, for our Club Mareva lounge of Marco's Club Mareva right. opening in Beirut, themed a lot around our brand. So we made a uh, Lebanese regional edition uh, called The Origins. And we still have those because Lebanon, as you might or might not know, is going through absolute hell at the moment. No banking system, what yeah. have you. So we got the cigars. The club is meant to be opening in September uh, anyway, uh, but we need cigars to get there. But we, so that's the only other regional we've made to honor the Club Marava and Club Marava Beirut. Uh, it's an amazing cigar because it's already aged about two years, thanks to Lebanese problems. Yeah, so that's with a that's a production from KBF. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll have some um, in the lounge here. You guys have got to come to Estonia to this lounge. Oh, let, let me tell you, man. When I saw that video shit. and I saw those chairs, it was like liquid caramel, man. I I can't wait. Oh, it's amazing. We've had people walk here and say. This is one of the most beautiful places we've seen. It's full of historic stuff. We've got um, an old ship from made by a Cuban by hand, the Victory. Let me show you this thing. You can always edit it and go beyond the hour. No, no, worry. no, that's fine. Um, that's yeah, let's have a look. We've got this. Let me show you this. I'll turn this around like that. This is handmade. Took six months to make. And um, so this is one of the sort of centerpieces. Wow. It's HMS Victory. All done by hand. If you look close enough, you'll see that the gun ports are staples. Everything he had to source there. I mean, there's so it's sort of things like this. I'm busy uh, going to probably make a Lancaster bomber to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, with the bouncing bomb. To honor the, uh, nice. the bouncing bomb. Yeah, so that's something I'm going to make myself, you know, which is uh, uh, for next year. So we like British icons of production we're going to put into this little corner of England and Estonia. And Estonia is beautiful as well. Come to see this the country. It's amazing. I, I, you know, I did a little research on Estonia. I was even telling, I was so, I was so taken by it. I even mentioned it to my wife. I oh, said, it's stunning. And they, they love Americans here too, because, you know, you're at the front line. So American soldiers are here and they're great. Um, and if you love your World War II history, I mean, you know, I just went recently, recently to the island of Sardamar. You just go, you see Russian helmets put on lampposts and there was a big fighting here. And so one guy had made his fence for his little cottage of German Corduroy Road. You know, they were evacuating. So Sarama was the last uh, battles in Estonia because they retreated to that island and went right down to the peninsula. Yeah. And there's shit everywhere. I mean, you can, there's one bar, bar, pub I was sitting into and it's like a, a, a German en aircraft engine all rusted up in the garden, you know, with the propellers, a fog wolf or something. Oh my God. Um, and oh, there's, there's, there's the trench systems here. I mean, there's big battles here. Uh, I, I was in Fresno talking about the big battle of cinema. And that's what encouraged them, says, we've got to come. You know, wow. a few people love, love uh, to, to come and see this World War II stuff. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, have I have to be one of them. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a lot of history here. We have um, in Tartu, it's where the great uh, um, uh, general, he fought the Russians, uh, Benningson, he was there. Um, you know, he was, he's from Estonia. So it's really uh, some good stuff. And Barclay de Tolly, of course. Barclay de Tolly, head of the Russian forces. He's a German Estonian. So, oh you know, God. and he, he fought, he fought uh, and he was the one who liberated Paris from Napoleon with the head of the Russian forces. So, you know, it's all here. <laughs> it's all there. It's all you need. <laughs> it's all. Yeah, Holy absolutely. Crap. Jeremy, I can't thank you enough for taking the time and sitting down with us and taking us through some of these oh. wonderful stories. Um, very enlightening. Um, even for somebody who's like me, who's been around, I am, I don't have the experience you have, obviously, but it's, uh, it's, it's really huge and it's so colorful. So, so, so rich. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for showing the interest, by the way, because I know, you know, you, you, you know, you, uh, God help Trina and, you know, 
thank you for all your interest and stuff. And I hope it went, hope we get to smoke in person. Yeah. Some so what way. I was going to say was I still, I have, a, I have a, sh a whole sheet filled with questions that, you know, I didn't even get to. Um, and you know, that's okay, but I'm hoping we can continue this discussion either through another absolutely. interview or might take well, you. Yes. Join you yes, in absolutely. If you have a lot of interest in your, this program you're putting together, then let's put another one together. You know, <laughs> no problem. Okay, we'll get some. Might be we'll more get, we'll get, we'll get, have it, we've got to get some cigars to you as well. Vlad will hate me for it, but come on, check some. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, you know. yeah. If, if you got to twist my arm, you got to twist my arm. I, I could do that. Okay, okay. Well, you know, let's see. In a couple of months, if we're all zooming around still, I'd be, I'd love to do it. Don't worry, it'd be, it'd be a great pleasure. All right, Jeremy. Thanks again. Uh, please stay safe and best to your family. You and train, and uh, please. Uh, um, I know I've been bugging her with a bunch of emails, so I... <laughs> no, she's amazing. Yeah. She's an amazing woman. A yeah. great marketing lady as well. She's responsible for a lot of this lovely, the whole website she put together, re-put together, you know. So uh, she, she's amazing. Thank you for that. And, say, and to all of your fans and everybody, stay, smoke, stay smoky, as they say. Is My great friend, uh, David Blanco, I just you know, copied him. But as I uh, finished by saying, as Macron, the president of France said, he says, you know, I think that this nicotine and tobacco, this stops COVID. So the tobacconist stayed open in France. <laughs> and, and, you know, actually, you've got to thank a cigar-friendly president there, Mr. Macron. Bless you. Merci. <laughs> okay. My pleasure. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. We'll talk to you soon. Bye next time, as we say, uh, nagamist. Okay. <laughs> sure.